Tonight, we are continuing our series on Psalm 27. And this is a psalm that I think is absolutely beautiful. It's a psalm that David wrote, and we know the Word of God declares that David was a man after God's own heart. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 27. We're going to read verses 4, 5, and 6 this evening. The title of the sermon is The Reward of Waiting on God. There is a reward spiritually that is available to each and every one of us as we wait on God. Psalm 27 verses 4 to 6 in the NIV. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of His sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At His sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy I will sing and make music to the Lord. It's a beautiful few verses there that we've read. Words that we may be relatively familiar with. The title of the sermon is The Reward of Waiting on God. I don't know about you, but I don't think waiting is something we do very well as Christians. We live in a society that is very instantaneous, give me what I want and what I need now. Waiting implies investment, sacrifice, not having what we want when we want, because there would be no gratitude in our hearts if we always got what we wanted when we wanted. But you know, waiting on God has a reward. And we're going to unpack that this evening. I believe that there are three key principles for each of those three verses that we've just read. So we'll go verse by verse. Number one, a surrendered heart is a seeking heart. David expressed only one wish, one desire, one goal, one dream, one ambition. He's incredibly focused. He doesn't give any shopping list of demands or desires. He doesn't even give alternatives or indicate that being in God's presence is just one preference amongst many. No, he has only one desire. He is unequivocally determined in his heart that nothing beats being in the presence of God. Can there anyone here tonight that can testify to that? Amen? The brilliant... A.W. Tozer said in his book, The Pursuit of God, that the way to a deeper knowledge of God is through the lonely valleys of soul poverty and abnegation of all things. It is important that we get still to wait on God. Then, if we will draw near to God and begin to hear Him, He will speak to us in our hearts. Abagnation, it's, it's a, another word that says essentially to renounce, to reject anything and everything else. And so my first question for you tonight, in your own heart and life, if I was to invite you onto this platform and I said to you in one sentence, give me your one thing, what would you communicate? What is your one thing? thing. What is the overarching heart desire in your own life? Because whatever you have determined to be your one thing, I guarantee you this, it will act and serve as a compass for every single part of your life, no exceptions. Essentially, what you decide today is your one thing will dictate and determine the direction and the destination of your life. David, liar, murderer, adulterer, he has a whole host of unhealthy, unholy 
uh, things attached to his life, and yet there he is at the very end of his life. The Word of God declares that God was pleased with him. Acts 13, 22, he was known as a man after God's own heart. How can God say that with that level of confidence? Because God knew the deepest recesses and desires of David's heart. And God knows the deepest recesses and desires of your heart too. Maybe you're unable to identify what that one thing is. I would encourage you that as you get into the presence of God, you will find that that one thing is the presence of God. God. David had determined and decided in his heart that nothing else mattered. And yet for us, often, the presence of God can crowd, be crowded out by all the other demands and expectations. When was the last time that you locked yourself away from the filth of this dying, destitute, decaying world? and you actually got alone with God. No cell phone, no TV, no internet, no distractions, nothing to derail or detour you from being in the presence of God. And you actually abided and dwelled in His presence. Psalm 84 verses 10 and 11 declares, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. David's desire to dwell and to abide in the presence of God emerged from a heart that was fully surrendered to the will of God. If Jesus Christ is Lord, He's only Lord if He's always Lord, and He's only Lord if He's always Lord over every aspect of your life. David wanted to live and abide in the tabernacle, surrounded by the presence of God, marveling at the beauty of God. Why? David had surrendered his entire heart to God. And so a surrendered heart will always be a seeking heart. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3 verse 10, that I may know Him. And just two verses before, in Philippians 3 verse 8, he says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Wow. Beautiful words and a beautiful expression of hearts that want to be in the presence of God. But more than that, David wanted to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. David knew beyond doubt that there was indescribable beauty in the very heart, the very nature, the very presence of God. Only eyes of faith will be able to comprehend that. He had no appetite for anything else. He wanted his heart, his mind, his entire life to be filled to overflowing with the greatness, the goodness, and the glory of God. But more than that, he also wanted to seek him in his temple. David was not complacent. This was a man that knew God, and he wanted yet more of God. And that's the danger for some of us in our Christian walk, whether it's our knowledge of Scripture, whether it's our length of time in knowing Jesus, is we can become complacent in our knowledge of God. We can reduce God to something or someone we know about. He is mysterious in every aspect of our lives, and we need to seek Him while He may be found, because He has yet more to unpack for us. He wanted more of God. He was determined and dedicated in ensuring that that could become a reality. And he was absolutely convicted to do whatever was necessary. He wanted the presence of God at all costs, at all times, in all seasons, in all circumstances. He was not selective 
in when he wanted to be in the presence of God. What could be better? David was not marveling, by the way, at any earthly structure. Don't think about it as a, some sort of physical a building. This particular psalm was written long before Solomon built the temple. What he was saying is, I want my entire life to be saturated in the presence of God. Number two, spiritual strength is always supernatural. Verse five, David was convinced that God had his righteous right hand protecting and preserving those who genuinely want to be in relationship with God. David was acutely aware that troubles would emerge for anyone that was pursuing and following Jesus passionately. But he was also a worthy recipient of God's protection and God's provision. He knew that God didn't just have the capacity, he had the capability of protecting him. And therefore he had no concerns, no worries about the challenges and the crisis that may have emerged in his life because he knew that God could protect him. God had already done it and God was still doing it in his own life. It's yet another example of God being able to demonstrate his faithfulness and favor to God. God never promised to protect David and therefore by extension any of us from the troubles that happen in our lives. The weapon may be formed, but it will not prosper in the name of Jesus Christ, amen? It doesn't say that we are exempt from the troubles, but we are covered and guarded and protected by a God who is sovereign. He promises to give us stability, security, and strength for each and every trial. However, we can allow our circumstances to dictate our feelings and emotions. We allow the lies of the enemy to infiltrate our lives. We forget the faithfulness and the goodness of God. We start to practically and naturally resolve our problems. Wrong approach. Take David's approach. He knew in the most challenging and chaotic of circumstances that he could take a supernatural response to a natural problem which means we too should take the same approach and tap into the limitless resources of God that is available to us. Do you know the Word of God declares in Psalm 34 verse 19 that the righteous endure many types of trials and troubles, but the Lord delivers them from each and every one. And so if you are going through a trial and a test today, can I tell you, God's hand of protection is over your life. You will get the spiritual strength that you need to take a supernatural response and reaction, and you will see God come through for you. David also acknowledged and accepted that even though he was dedicating and devoting his life to God, that he would be permanently protected, that didn't stop the enemies surrounding him. And the same is true for us. Number three, faith tested is faith triumphant. David declares it in verse 6, then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Powerful but purposeful declarations by David. What is he actually communicating to each and every one of us? He is saying that he is secure and he is steadfast in God's protection despite his overwhelming circumstances. He's not discouraged or divided in his heart, even though his physical circumstances have undoubtedly been daunting and difficult for him. He was stable, he was secure, and he was steadfast in who he was in God, but also in who God was to him. A defiance and a determination because he knew who God was. No, gu no guilt, no fear, no worry in David's heart. Because of this truth, David's heart is overflowing with joy and gladness in the goodness of God. Life can be amazing when God is good. Amen? We go from glory to glory, 
testimony to testimony, favor to favor, breakthrough to breakthrough. And it's easy then to say that our levels of faith are high. But what about when we go from trial to trial? What about when we go from disappointment to disappointment? When we go from brokenness to what is seemingly more brokenness? When we go from turmoil to yet more turmoil? When we go from moments of deep distress and anguish to yet more moments of deep distress and anguish? How's your faith then? Faith tested is faith triumphant. And the Word of God is so clear that it is faith that pleases God. It's all there in Hebrews 11. You can read the hall of fame of faith heroes in the Scripture and their stories in nutshells. But only faith tested is faith triumphant. Faith does not deny a problem's existence in your life. It denies it a place of influence. Because God is sovereign. He rules and He reigns. Sometimes the miracle is to keep on keeping on. To worship God irrespective of how you feel. Sometimes we sing songs because we know. Sometimes we sing the songs until we know. Both are true. Sometimes we worship God until we believe. Sometimes we worship God because we believe. David knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that God was good. He knew that God was faithful. His heart was full of joy, full of celebration for all that God has done. And I wonder today, can we do the same? Because God is looking for hearts that will worship Him in spirit and truth. Not hearts that are divided. Hearts that are constantly wanting to express worship and praise to a God who has been faithful to a thousand generations, whose mercies are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness over our lives. A God who holds our entire world in the palm of His hand. A God who has rescued and redeemed us from our sins and our transgressions. A God who has given us eternal life. A God who has banished our sins as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more. Hallelujah. And the word of God declares in Psalm 25 verse 3 that those who put their trust in the Lord are never put to shame. Where is your trust and faith tonight? In whom is your trust and your faith? A God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all that we can possibly ask or imagine. Psalm 34 verse 8, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. Do you know, God is always waiting to commune with you. Have you ever done those spiritual appraisals? You may, you know, may, I do it from time to time where you take a month or maybe three months or even a year and go, how am I doing? On your best day, when you are at like peak desire to spend time with God, he's always 1% or more more. God will always want to spend time with you more than you will ever want to spend time with him. He created you with a plan and a purpose and a destiny to fulfill in Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you, commune with God. You never have to worry about being overlooked, pushed to the margins, discarded, rejected. You just need sincerity in your heart. Matthew 6, 33, words we know well. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and everything else will be given to you. What about Jeremiah 29? We all know verse 11, but I'm going to give us 11, 12, and 13 so we have the correct context. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, 
not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Beautiful words, beautiful declarations. What is the result of our faith being tested? It produces victory and breakthrough. You rise up in worship and adoration to God for what he has done. Just like David, you posture and position your heart to God and God alone. Faith tested is faith triumphant. It brings something of a celebration, a victory, and a breakthrough from your heart that once again God has demonstrated his faithfulness in your life. How could you not worship him in that moment? So what am I saying to us tonight? David had a deep desire to seek the Lord because he had already enjoyed, encountered, and experienced how good God is. That truth, that reality, fueled his desire to press in for more. If you want genuine intimacy with God, you can achieve this. There is no force, no power, no person on the face of the earth that can stop you encountering God but you. Here's what I've discovered in my own times in pursuing God with intimacy. You see things in the spiritual, supernatural realm through divine revelation. You see your life, your family, your ministry, everything and everyone around you the way that God sees those things and people. Your perspective shifts. Your mind, your heart is totally recalibrated to the things of the kingdom and not the things of self. It always will emerge in a heart that is soft and teachable. Jesus said that seeking was sufficient. Imagine that. Seeking is sufficient. Seek first. It doesn't even indicate there that you will find. There is power and purpose simply in pursuing. And I wonder if that's something in our hearts. Often we will pursue something because we want the goal, the destination, the outcome. But I wonder tonight if our hearts can just be postured to pursuing, to waiting. Not passively, not just sitting down with our arms crossed, waiting on God, okay, Lord, what's happening? It's not a passive, inactive response. It, you have enthusiasm, you have energy, you have excitement, you have expectation in your heart that you will encounter the one true and living God for your life. And as I've said, the Word of God declares it, the measure you seek Him is the measure that you will find him. A heart full of expectation. Pursuing God will produce character and spiritual muscles in our lives. It guarantees that God has the authority and the autonomy to mature parts of our character and our hearts. David's heart has already been permanently marked by the grace and the goodness of God. He knew beyond doubt that God had been good to him. He recognized and remembered that there is a reward of waiting on God, and the reward is God himself, not what God can do for you. God himself. That is ultimately all that he promises us, is the promise of his presence. So take a moment tonight to recall in your own heart and life, the first time that you encountered God, where you met with God, you actually met with God. How was your heart? What adjectives are filling your mind? Splendor, majestic, beautiful, glorious. These are words 
to describe our God. A.W. Tozer, again, in his book, The Pursuit of God, declares complacency is a deadly foe to all spiritual growth. And that's the danger for us in our Christian walk. As we grow, as we mature, we become proficient and professional in our Christian walk. And here is David literally encountering God, and he's got no complacency. He's like, nope, I want more. I want to pursue. I want to go further. I want to go deeper. I want to go higher in my intimacy and in my relationship with God. I want to get to that level of intimacy in my own life where other pursuits fall away to the margins of my life because I'm pursuing the one true and living God. What is more important and what is more precious to us than the highest level of intimacy that a human heart can possibly comprehend? David wants to dwell there. He doesn't just want an encounter on a Sunday or an experience in a worship night. He wants to dwell there. To dwell somewhere means to take up residence, to abide, to live. That's what David wants. He's like, no, 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 I'm not, I, I don't just want a little experience here on a Sunday for half an hour. I want to live here night and day, day and night. Wow. A man after God's own heart. I believe tonight there are some stuff, places, people that we need to consign to the history pages of our lives. Don't you want to walk with God to know him? What is the deepest desire of your heart today? David's heart was clear, peerless, unbeatable, unsurpassable. A deep conviction in his heart. That is the undiluted truth. Every single day, we need to remember and recognize that we would be utterly lost without God. If anybody here thinks that you've got life worked out without God, I can tell you humbly, solemnly, but respectfully, you are gravely mistaken. We need to be anchored in the presence of God. Psalm 62, verses 5 to 8. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in Him at all times. You people, pour out your hearts to Him, for God is our refuge. The moment you posture your heart to God, the moment you decide to wait on God, there is a reward. A spirit of meekness and humility emerges as we start to hear what God is saying to us. Deeper levels of obedience in our walk with God emerges. Perhaps you're struggling to hear from God, therefore you're struggling to obey God. Find rest in Him. Pour out your heart to Him. Obedience will ultimately follow. David uses the word, show me the path, lead me in the way, in so many of his Psalms that he writes because he wants to walk that right path with God, recognizing that he too can be distracted and derailed from the plan and purpose of God in his life. And so this evening, as I draw to a close, I have only really three questions. Perhaps you want to take a moment to bow your head, close your eyes, and you can reflect on these questions. Have you truly, truly surrendered your heart to God? It's a very profound but poignant question. If you're unsure of the answer, ask yourself this. Is the default of your heart to seek God? If the answer to that is no, then with the greatest of respect, I would suggest to you that you have not yet surrendered your heart to God. 
And I will encourage you to do that tonight. The second question is what strength are you tapping into? Is it your experience, your expertise, your knowledge of God? Are you allowing the supernatural strength of God to fill you? Has a spirit of complacency quietly, subtly crept in, whereby you operate naturally, you respond naturally to natural things, you rely on your experience, your expertise, you rely on intellect, information, but not your intimacy with God. Here is David, walking closely with God, quite literally a man after God's own heart, and there is not one shred of complacency. Why? Because he recognized that spiritual strength is supernatural. It comes from God and God alone. And the third question for your consideration tonight, how is your faith? What is your faith in? Is it in self? Is it in the ways of the world? Is it in the things of this world? Or is it in God? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith tested is faith triumphant. The reward of waiting on God is really two things. More of God. But before that, God Himself. And I don't know where you are, but I don't just want to know about God, things about God. I want to know God. And I want Him to know me. What is that one thing? I asked that at the start. I believe tonight we need to all turn individually but corporately as a church family towards Jesus. We need to learn to wait on God, that that waiting has a reward and the reward is His presence. The reward is more of Him, but it starts with a heart that desires Him, like David. One thing I ask, one thing, so singular focus of a man who was utterly devoted to God. I just want to be in your presence and I'll wait as long as it takes because I know the reward is worth it. And yet so often in our lives, we wait on things or people not knowing if the reward will even emerge, much less if it's worth the wait. But with God, we get a guarantee, no exceptions. He proves himself time and time again. So if there's anything that I've said tonight that's relevant or applicable to you, and it should be all of us, I want you to stand as a response in the house of the Lord tonight. And what we're going to do is we're going to sing a song called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And in these moments, I want you to pour out your worship, your praise and your heart to Him and tell Him tonight, You, Lord, the power of Your presence, that's my one thing. I want my reward for waiting on You and I will wait as long as it takes because my life is in your hands. If you believe that, stand with me in the house of the Lord and let's worship him together. God bless you.